So I'm here, I want to talk about space, um, because I think a lot of the, the VR applications we see today um, are all built around space and the capability to move within space. And for, for us, at least when we look at, at VR and also later AR and, and mixed reality, space is the, is the factor that always comes back. And for us, only that is the true VR in that sense where you can really interact with reality. If you have a 360 degree video or something similar, it doesn't give you that capability of interacting. And, and I think last year there was a lot of talks about actually the realization of that, and now a lot of companies moved onwards and actually are trying to provide solutions for that interactivity. However, from our point of view, what I want to show today is that this component from a technical side, which you have to develop in order to be able to move, interact, capture space, is something which is not at all constrained to, to VR, but it's something which is applicable to a much broader audience, especially from a technological point of view. This is the interesting fact, and that is that in the end, what you will see is that tech companies which are developing for VR might end up having products in completely different areas, and companies from completely different areas will suddenly join the VR industry because they build a core technology which is applicable and which basically solves the problem between the interaction of reality and space. So, what do we do? First slide. Um, we're basically building a digital copy of reality, which means we define it as artificial reality, which means that it's three-dimensional models, which are photorealistic, and then we take it one little step further, and this is really essential, we're starting to add contextual information, such as materials, for instance, object classification. Through that, you can then infer the physics of that object and that environment, and then you can start relighting it and actually making it very dynamic. So the last part is the step from having a static kind of snapshot of what reality looks like as a volumetric, three-dimensional, photorealistic model, and turn it into something which is interactable and where you, in the end, can run simulations on top. So the first part is good, and it enables you to move around and to do certain things, but what you really want is that second part. And from a company perspective, we really believe that our responsibility in the end is to provide this technology to as many industries and people and players and companies and NGOs as possible, that they can essentially build their products on top of our platform, on top of that capability to interact with space. Next slide, please. So when we talk about photorealistic 3D models, this is the screenshot um, from, a, from a model we took. I, is rendered from eight images. So we have to take eight images in order to get a photorealistic model. Um, and we're gonna apply this mainly to outdoor environments because for us that's more scalable. And we're gonna apply it mainly through cities. So if we think about the city of Zurich, which has roughly 100 square kilometers in size, with 10 drones, we simulate that we will be able to capture that space at at least centimeter, if not sub-centimeter accuracy, so going into this photorealism space in roughly two hours. So with that technology, you have a scalability factor that you can actually create this digital copy of cities and then eventually the entire planet very, very fast. And then what we want to do is provide actually that um, these models to different things. Now, the same technology also, of course, applies to smaller objects. Um, so here we got a car part, which was, uh, it's actually um, a bearing for, for a wheel um, of, a, of a Formula student car. They, they run the world record in that in acceleration from zero to 100. Um, and this friend came over and said, like, yeah, we're always kind of measuring these parts and it's really tedious. Can you just like make a reconstruction and see how that actually gets out? And we're like, yeah, well, it's metal and metal has like, reflective surfaces and hmm, not sure it's going to be good. And then we did it. and. Poof, it came out and was perfect. I'm like, yeah, this is cool. Um, so the same technology applies to small objects, but also to large objects. Um, but of course, our focus in the end is, is, um, is large environments. Now, from a technological point of view, what did we do to actually achieve that? Um, so the, the first corner bit is, is really important is the camera. So we've been developing um, a new kind of camera over the past th three years now, where we increase the resolution of the camera of a very significant amount. 
So if you have cameras today, the, the very professional ones um, have between 30, maybe 50 megapixels, and then you're already on the very far end of professional cameras. Most cameras which are used in, in, in kind of VR settings or also for volumetric capturing on drones or anything else have around 12 to 20 megapixels. The problem is we as humans, we perceive roughly 575 megapixels if we look at reality. So if you want to be able to provide 3D models which are very photorealistic, you somehow have to change that capture medium. You have to significantly boost the resolution in order to satisfy the human eye in order to be actually photorealistic. That's what we've been doing on the camera side. So we have now, um, we were getting the first samples of that version with 1,500 megapixels um, this month, and then uh, next month it should be the first um, cameras rolled out from, from our manufacturer in Japan. And we took the first pictures with our lab prototype and turned them into 3D models, or at least tried to, and then we run into a completely different problem, which is all the current softwares and algorithms have been built around exactly these 20 or 30 or 50 megapixels. But if you end up having 500 megapixels and more, you suddenly come into a problem which have, hasn't been solved yet because these algorithms, they scale to the power of two. So the more, if you put twice the resolution, you need four times the computational power. So if you put in, in comparison to a 12 megapixel camera, 100 times the resolution, that's gonna be a big, big, big pain and that's just for one pair of images. So if you scale this up to a city where you have a data amount of roughly 7.5 petabytes, you're pretty much done. And that was one of the big problems that we solved over the past few years now. Um, and now we're working on exactly adding these additional features, um, like recognizing glass, for instance, that's always been a big topic, uh, that you have the transparency of the glass, that you have the reflectivity of glass, and recognizing different materials um, in order to be able to simulate even more. Now, from a product perspective, let's mo mo move to that side. Um, what we provide in the end um, is not the camera, is not the software, but they're ready to use 3D models. And this through our platform, and then in a way that they're interactable. So what we end up with is having the, the, the platform, the computational resources as well, where you can build your products around this, this um, 3D environments. What we envision is that in, in, in five years, if you want to create a game which is city scale, like for instance GTA 5, maybe less violent, you basically can do this in, in a couple of months because you only have to construct a story around it. But the visual models, the visual base is all there. The physics is there. And the same kind of logic applies into other industries. We heard before about architects. They want to visualize their work to their clients in a very convenient way. They don't want to go and reconstruct these things and, and rebuild these environments and then put their stuff there. They just want to have the capability to take the CAD models, put it into our platform, and then get the experience and be able to actually tell people how this is going to look like. The next industry that, that we're tackling now, just go on back, um, is, is the automotive industry. And I'm, I'm going to make with this example show how the, the, the core technologies of VR, AR, MR, are applicable to completely different industries, which have nothing to do with it, but they need the same core. Um, and in the end, what we really do is, is world scale simulation in that sense. So if you look at VR, um, next slide, please. Um, next slide. So th there is one good thing, VR is a bit further than, than mixed reality and, and augmented reality. They have the display. Currently, I guess the problem is still what is the killer application, what is the, the, the way to actually earn money, what is the business models that apply for VR, um, and that links to a second problem, which is content. Next slide, please. Um, so the content currently still is really expensive to produce. It's really difficult, as we saw also with Google before, to actually get this content onto the glasses if you have it in the first place. So there's still a lot of problems that have to be solved around that. But VR is, for us, sort of the, the first testing bet for what is coming afterwards with mixed reality and augmented reality, which in the end, in our opinion, will, will rule basically everything. I mean, it will, will be so integrated in our, our everyday life. It, will, it might replace smartphones, computers. Uh, it will just make the world a completely interactive space. So if we, if we look at that, um, 
then we see basically, next slide. Um, yeah, I just, uh, for us it was interesting um, that last year when we tried to explain people what we do, th there is a huge shift between 12 months ago and today. Today everyone understands that 3D is super important and it's going to be used for a lot of different things. But a year ago it was still the case that people were like, what is AR? And then this thing called Pokemon Go came by and now suddenly everyone understands it. My mother was like, I finally get what you guys are doing. This is awesome. This is amazing. And they're like, this is not AR. This is just like, ugh. But I think it served the industry really well. And it showed the potential to a lot of people what might happen in the future. Um, so if we quickly move through this, to make that work, we have four basic challenges. First, and that's different to VR, we need the glasses. If you have the next slide, please. Next slide, please. So we need the glasses, so they need to be see-through. That's optically a bit more challenging to have a, than to have a display in front of you that takes you completely out of context. There's a couple of companies working on that. The maybe most promising is Magic Leap, but um, except very high valuations and a lot of buzz, no one or the public doesn't have, haven't seen anything yet, so we don't know. It just seems that, considering the players investing, they seem to be on a good way. Then the second challenge is positioning. So there is now um, a company in, in, in Switzerland actually was bought just recently called the CUDA. Um, they're doing inside out tracking. Um, Microsoft has something in place, Meta has something in place, but it's still, if you look at these experiences, sometimes a bit gibberish, and it doesn't work on, on a city scale. So if you want to have 3D models in an AR environment overlaid over reality, you need to know where you are in space very precisely, and you need to know it on a, on a large factors. Because if you're in a city in an AR environment, you want to have personalized advertisement, you want to have the city interactive. But your skyscraper might be 200 meters away, and there is currently no sensor which is small enough to go into a glass, and it, from a physics point of view, will also not happen in the future to position you very accurately in space. So that problem is a massive problem. And then the third problem is you have to understand this environment. I need to understand to make AR happen that this is a chair, that this is a bottle of water, that this is a camera, that this is a human being, and ideally what human being that is. Still very difficult. Fourth problem, content again. So this, is, this is coming back. Because if you have an AR glass, you don't want to have a virtual screen there and then you watch TV kind of floating in the air. You want to have a hologram. You want to have your sports game being as a hologram broadcasted in front of you and you can actually enter the playing field and be completely immersed in it. But no one is talking that this content has to be recorded in the first place. You don't have volumetric content just by having glasses. And you don't want to have 2D content if you have AR glasses. That's not going to be fun. I mean, then I have just a screen that's cheaper and more convenient. Now, and then the last part is power. I mean, we all know that um, from, from, from VR as well, power is a, is a big constraint, um, but that's going to be solved. Moore's law. Now, autonomous driving, same challenges. First challenge, positioning. Exact same thing. If the car doesn't know down to a centimeter where it is on a, on a road, it's not going to be able to drive autonomously. And that question is still one of the major questions when you look at autonomous driving on a, on a big scale. So same problem. Second, understand your environment. So guess what? If you're a car, you want to know there's a pedestrian, there's a cyclist, there's a different car, there's a red light, there is a traffic sign, there's a stop sign, there is a crossing. You need to understand these things. Same problem from a conceptual point of view. Third, content. The content for, for autonomous cars is a bit different because they need to be able to learn. So they need to be able to train, they need to be able to simulate a lot of data. You don't want to have a, or let's take the, the, the human kind of reference. If you as a human being drive your, home, your, your road home, which you have driven already a thousand times, you drive better than if you're suddenly in India where you have never been before, we don't know the traffic rules, where you don't know how the traffic actually organizes and you have a car you have never driven before. You're gonna be a crappy driver in, in that moment. But back home, you're a good driver. So they need that content. 
And then if you go, what they do currently is they use computer games, uh, like GTA 5, for instance, but computer games are not reality. They're just some abstract, some, some idealized version of it, and that's basically it. Next slide, please. So our vision in the end is to provide that digital copy of reality on a very large scale. And the interesting part is that although we're completely committed to VR still, that now other industries are trying to contact us and getting in touch with us, such as, for instance, autonomous car industry, and they go like, guys, we need your environments. We need your capability to actually simulate this. And this is exactly where VR as a, as a technological industry is very cross-sectional. If you solve one of these problems, you're not going to have one client. You're going to have five, six, seven different clients from different industries. And in every industry, you're going to have multiple clients as well. So whenever you're a tech company and you're working on these problems, or also as, a, as an artist for, for storytelling, you're not working for VR alone. You're working for a whole bunch of other industries as well. And that's important to realize. Because it's going to be tough to find the money at the moment, um, especially the next two years, because it's a young industry for many reasons. So maybe that, that thought that your technology might be applicable to other fields too might be very important for you guys. This is our team. Uh, we're currently 20 people, so that's just a part of it. Um, a, a huge thank you to those, because without them, we couldn't have pulled it off so far, and we'll also not be able to pull it off in the future. Uh, in the end, they make the magic happen. Um, they're the ones who, who do everything. Thank you very much. <laughs>